my horror loving dudes i'm killjoy jake and today we're going to rank all of the ghost face killers thus far including the one or ones from scream 6. speaking of which there will be scream 6 spoilers in this video so do not watch any further if you have not seen the movie yet all right now let's get into it well sometimes that is better Okay, so first thing right out the gate, we gotta discuss what actually makes a ghost face killer and where my stance on it is necessarily. As Tyler Gillette recently stated in an interview, Scream 6 kinda throws a big ol' monkey wrench into that punch bowl. That, that was two metaphors that I just mixed together and then don't make any sense. You can make the argument that Greg and Jason at the very beginning of this film are not our ghost face killers, but if Scream 6 played out like a normal Scream film, they probably would have been the killers overall. I made the argument in my Scream 6 review that Greg would have been a normal character in this movie had he actually stayed alive for a little longer than just becoming a pile of meat in the fridge. And we also have some ghost face killers this time that didn't even score any kills. So what does that mean for them? Are they even killers? or what's going on there. And then we also had Sydney put on the robe at the end of the first one, and then we have Sam put it on here. So what identifies as a ghost face killer? Personally, I'm going with every character that is seen as a villain in these said movies. I think that's the big attribute that we haven't really talked about yet. I don't see Sam as a ghost face killer until she's portrayed as a villain, and although we've been hinting at that in the last two movies, that technically has not happened yet. So for right now, which may change in the future, trust me, they're setting up something with Sam. I don't know what that is. But for right now, I'm not going to count Sam Carpenter and I'm not going to count Sidney Prescott because they're not villain characters yet. But I will be counting Greg and Jason. I mean, Jason gets a kill as a ghost face, so he's definitely one. Greg, on the other hand, never officially scored a kill, but he knew that Jason was going to kill and he was an accomplice. And if this was like a murder trial and all that, he would also get in trouble. But speaking of Greg, in last place goes Greg. He's objectively the worst ghost face. He literally gets killed by another ghost face and just becomes a pile of meat. I just really like saying pile of meat, if you couldn't tell. It's so much fun. I could do it all day. Meat. But yeah, not too much more to say about Greg, you know? I mean, he just, he died. <laughs> that's, that's about it. He's purposefully a bad ghost face so that the opening scene of Scream 6 can be pretty f***ing metal, though. Absolutely coming in 13th place is Jason. While Jason has one of the most unexpected reveals of the entire franchise, he's still at the bottom of my list because he only scores one kill and his whole plan falls flat in literally the opening scene of this new movie. Once again, all things done on purpose and these characters are supposed to be pretty lame and I kind of love it for that reason. Jason is definitely a little higher on my list personally though over Greg because of the way he talks about killing Samara Weaving's Laura Crane. It's a sickening monologue about killing somebody, and he talks about how every time he poked her with the knife, she felt less human, almost like an animal. We then get some of the best Ghostface lines I've ever heard in a movie when Ghostface says, do you feel like an animal, Jason? And he says something to the degree of who cares about the f***ing movies. Like, it's awesome. It's I, I love it. I love that opening scene so much. It's so good. I, I can't get over it. Talking more on Scream 6, though, coming in 12th place is going to be Quinn Bailey, a character that I do really like, but I just didn't see enough of in the third act. Scream 6 was talked full of characters and did a lot of development, so much so that it even took over the murder spree at the end of the film. Besides the killers, there's like no murders in the second half of this movie, which bothers me a little bit, but this movie was so good, I don't even care. I feel like I could have used a little more from both of Richie's siblings personally, but there was three killers at the end, it's a little harder to like specify time for all of them to give their big monologue. That's not to say I don't like Quinn though, because she has some awesome dialogue in this third act. Liana Liberato is terrifying in this role too, just the way she looks at Sam when she's dragging the knife across the rail. Ugh, it's just gross, man. She's a nasty little freak in this movie, and I certainly dig it, but she could have used some more screen time, in my opinion. Let's just say that Mickey and the Kirsch siblings here have a lot in common. Coming in 11th place is Richie's brother, Ethan. Once again, I liked these characters. I just felt like there wasn't all that much to them. I did enjoy their performance, though, in the third act. I only put Jack Champion's Ethan character above Liana Liberato because he gets some really nasty lines to say at the end of this film, and also has one of my favorite killer deaths of all time. He talks about how he always wanted to stick something in Tara, like the disgusting little incel that he is, and then she kind of face him with the knife. Why are you booing me? I'm right. The sexual subtext of his death is very interesting to me, and I love that they set up, he's like, oh, I'm gonna die a virgin, oh no, and then that's literally the last thing Tara says to him. The setups in Scream 6 are done very, very well. And then Ethan literally dies from the same TV that kills Stu, which is such a statement in and of itself. So for all the people who want Stu to come back, I guess you also want Ethan to come back as well, because TVs don't kill people, apparently. Coming in 10th place is my formerly least favorite ghost face, your favorite ghost face, 
apparently, Charlie. All the way back in the days yonder when we only had nine ghost face killers, Charlie beat out Stu for being the one of the best ghost faces, and I'm still perplexed by that. People have made many good points about Charlie that he does get the majority of the kills in Scream 4. In fact, he gets one of the coolest kills, which is Olivia Morris. And I will admit, his reveal is pretty cool, but Kirby lived through that reveal, so it's kind of underwhelming in my opinion. Also, his motive is that he's simping for Jill Roberts, so like, when Kirby comes on to him, don't you think there might have been a moment where he was like, hey, maybe we should stop all these killings, you know? Like, maybe we should stop doing this, and I can go off with Kirby a little bit. The motive, though, isn't my biggest thing about Charlie. That I can get past, it's no big deal. I like to make my jokes, but at the end of the day, that doesn't bother me with Charlie. What does bother me, though, is that Kirby comes on to the guy, and then he still decides to kill her and still is like, you just noticed me now, man? Like, what? My thinking here is that Jill is going to kill the guy anyways, right? So why not already set up like there's gonna be this diffusion between our ghost face killers where maybe Charlie wants to back out last minute after the reveals because he loves Kirby now. He's like, well, Kirby likes me, so I don't even know why I'm doing this. Then after the reveals, you can have Jill kill him because it's like, okay, well, you're backing out. Well, screw you. I just feel like that's better set up for a ghost face diffusion where it's like they're no longer working together anymore. That would be really interesting. We could have set up the ending of Scream 4 a little better for the accomplice character here, but overall, that third act is immaculate. Coming in ninth place is Roman Bridger from Scream 3, a character that is very much so diminished in my eyes. Like I was saying in my ranking of these movies, I just feel like this is the same thing from Scream 2 again, but they just did it worse and they didn't really add much to it. Roman Bridger was living a pretty good life directing horror movies and making lots of money. He probably should have left the half-brother thing in the past. So what, he orchestrated the whole Billy and Stu thing? That kind of makes Scream 1 a little less interesting. It's no longer about two greasy teenagers who really liked horror movies, it's now a personal vendetta thing which makes it immediately less scary to me. Scream 3 puts a big emphasis on the personal vendetta thing, which yes, was always a big factor in Billy and Stu's motive, but the cooler thing in my mind is the fact that they were just obsessed with horror movies. I mean, Stu is really only in it because he likes horror movies so much, it's Billy who's got the whole personal vendetta thing. That's the more interesting angle to Scream 1 to me. It's scarier, it can happen to anybody, and it doesn't feel specific to one character. Like, I can watch Scream 1 and be like, holy f that can happen to me. But then when I watch Scream 3, it's like, this isn't scary, this is just a story about Sidney Prescott. And it's good, but it takes the scariness out of Scream 1 a little bit, so I'm not the biggest fan of Roman Bridger. You might be wondering why I put him so high, though, even after all that criticism. Well, he does kill John Milton, who is supposed to be our Weinstein stand-in, and that's probably my favorite part of Scream 3 at this point, because the Weinsteins f***ing suck. I also really like Scott Foley. I think he's a killer actor, and although I may not like the words that are actually coming out of his mouth in this third act, I love the way he delivers them. <laughs> Him and Sydney have some really good banter in this third act that is really interesting and fun and just like it really hypes things up here for a explosive third act. I like it. It's it's not the worst third act in the in the franchise. Coming in eighth place, which I'm sure is going to surprise many, is Mrs. Loomis or Debbie Salt. I only put this character so high because she is technically the first time we get our family relations type killer character. So we kind of established that which would influence many of the other sequels. In fact, because Scream 6 is connected to Richie Kirsch, technically Practically every single sequel is inspired a little bit by Scream 2. She gets some brownie points for being that influential, but personally, I'm just not that big a fan of her. The tiny punch-in shots we get with Lori Metcalf are just her and Gail kind of going back and forth talking about things that never matter. And the only indication that our main killer this time around could be from Woodsboro is when li literally she straight up just says to the camera, maybe the killer could be from Woodsboro. It's just not a good way to write dialogue. You're not supposed to tell the audience exactly what you're doing in this scene. And then she also does the exact opposite. She tells you exactly why she's there in that one little scene, and then the rest of it, not, none of it matters. Like, it's it's like the two extremes of writing dialogue, where shit doesn't matter, or you're just telling it straight in the face. And they do both of that with all of her punch-ins. And then when you get to the ending, where she's like, oh, I'm Billy's mom, it's such a sucker punch, because there was absolutely no setup to that prior to this. I had a lot of people in my ranking video say, but like, that's why it's such a good twist. I would argue that anybody could write a twist like that. If I'm writing a standard murder mystery and the whole time you're looking at all these different characters and you're like oh is it, it maybe it's maybe it's ronald i don't know he seems kind of suspicious but then at the last minute as an alien cyborg squid thing jumps out of nowhere and is like i am cyrax the destroyer of worlds and i'm the killer yeah that's a shock 
but it's not a very good one. Her motive comes out of absolutely nowhere, there's no setup to it, and she overshadows the much more interesting character, or should I say the other killer, in Scream 2, which really sucks in my mind. Like I said, she gets brownie points for being so influential, apparently everyone loves this character except me, but I don't know, I just, I don't really care for her. Speaking of Scream 2 though, in 7th place comes Mickey Altieri, Altieri, Mickey Mouse, I don't know how to pronounce that last name. If Mickey had more screen time, which he unfortunately does not in Scream 2, he would be my number one killer. Like, like, without a doubt, conceptually, this is the most interesting ghost face we have ever gotten, and he's overshadowed by Billy's mother. Mickey is a serial killer for hire who is kind of a fall guy because he wants to get in trouble and blame it all on the movies. It is easily the most perfect motive for any of these movies, and it is underdeveloped to say the least. Why Timothy Oliphant's Mickey character is not the leader in Scream 2, I will never quite understand. He is seriously such a great character and just does not have enough screen time to be considered great. It's such a shame, I wish we had more Mickey. Like I said, he would shoot right up to the top if he was our focus of Scream 2. Coming in sixth place is Detective Bailey. Yeah, I know his performance is a little wacky, but it works a lot better than Mrs. Loomis, in my opinion, because there's actual setup to this. You can look at Detective Bailey and just say, oh, well, this is just Scream 2 again, but there's so much more to his motive than what meets the eye. Like, if you actually listen to what he says, it's more than just being Richie's father, which is what makes him so fascinating to me. He talks about how he doesn't even like the movies and how he may have let Richie's obsession get the best of him, and he just feels bad as a father, and he wants to cover up all the bad shit he did by blaming everything on Sam. That is so much more interesting to me than anything Mrs. Loomis ever said in Scream 2. And listen, Dermot Mulroney is ridiculous in the sixth act. I mean, he's literally laughing as he's shooting at Sam and missing every bullet. Like, why are you laughing, bro? What's going on here? But the setup with his character is so much better than some of our other Ghostface killers. Like, he actually seems like he could be Richie's father by the end of this. Every time Detective Bailey calls Sam with the Ghostface voice, it's through Richie's contact on her phone. Very nice little setup. It's super subtle. Something a little less subtle, though, is when Detective Bailey comes out after seeing his dead in quotation marks, daughter, <laughs> and then he walks out and he's got a limp. He's very obviously the killer. He says this line to her saying like, oh, you kill one of my own, you die. Right there, you can tell he's the killer, but Sam gives this line right back saying, absolutely. Like, yes, I'm on your side. Let's catch this mother... And it's great. It's great setup. It's dramatic irony. And if you're watching this movie like a typical Scream film and you're like, oh man, like it's got to be a good reveal at the end, you're going to be disappointed with this movie. I totally get why people didn't like the third act, but this movie wasn't about the killer reveal. I mean, we even have Dermot Mulroney say at the end, yeah, of course it's me. They put that line there on purpose because this movie is about a lot of the other reveals and improving upon a past motive that didn't really work so well in Scream 2. While I've always felt that the family motive is a little cheesy, Detective Bailey and Jill have maybe really come around to it. I think it really works now because of those two characters. Roman and Mrs. Loomis, however, it's just a little too campy for me. Moving into our top five, in fifth place is Amber Freeman. Probably the most underrated ghost face killer of all time. I couldn't tell you why people hate this character. I think she is f***ing scary. <laughs> if Amber Freeman was in my closet at night, I would be shitting my pants paralyzed in fear. This woman is f***ing crazy. The Dewey Slayer herself got most of our kills in Scream 5, which gets major props for me. She has these super crazy creepy little character moments where she goes up to Sydney with a knife and she's like, ee, ee. like, I don't know. It's just like, that's such a freaky thing to do in that very tense situation. She's just not bothered by it at all. Mikey Madison perfectly portrays this character and she probably has the coolest reveal in the entire franchise. Literally just shooting Liv McKenzie in the face mid conversation. I love Scream 5. I don't know why people hate that movie so much. In fourth place, though, is our other Scream 2022 killer, Richie Kirsch. Both of the Scream 5 killers have moved up immensely on my list, especially after Scream 6 that really propped them up. Richie has so much more character development, especially after seeing all of his little home movies in Scream 6 that are gross. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of a certain character from a certain fan film that was in certain disgusting underwear with piss stains. But I, I don't know. Despite popular belief, Richie's motive is very interesting and very fitting for the requel movie in this franchise. Instead of actually making a stab movie, he just wants to give Hollywood better ideas so they make better stab movies. It's so interesting and so perfect for a requel movie. Richie Kirsch is someone who believes that movies just stopped being good in the 90s, but he's blinded by nostalgia. Just like how a lot of people are these days. His motive works so well for a requel movie, and on top of that, he has Amber doing all the work for him in this movie. Like, it's just, he's such a great, well-developed character. I don't know. Easily one of my favorite killers in a 
across the entire franchise. Taking the bronze for this list, though, is going to be Billy Loomis, probably the character you think of when you think of Ghostface. Billy is another character whose legacy has been built upon in these later sequels. He's even involved in them, playing a Force Ghost version of himself. It's a bit cheesy and campy, and definitely does not add as much to the character as, like, Scream 6 does to Richie, but it's still really interesting to see him come back for all these other movies. He has some of the best lines in the entire franchise when he's licking all the fake blood off of his fingers. Corn syrup. Same stuff they use for pig's blood and carry. That boy surely does love to lick some fingers, I'll tell you what. He's stone cold serious and creepy at the end of this film too, kind of saying some nasty sh** to Sydney, and I just want him to die so bad. <laughs> he also makes for a great counter to Stu Mocker, who's very high energy and ridiculous and over the top, while Billy is a little more stoic and stern and sociopathic and cold. Skeet Ulrich's more sociopathic take on this killer definitely elevates Stu Mocker's performance from Matthew Lillard though, and I just, I love it. The relationship is just so well done here. It's definitely the best out of all these movies. Speaking of sociopathic though, coming in second, taking the silver medal is Jill Roberts, the coldest, most evil evil lemon scented ghost face killer of them all. It's bad to kill all of your friends for some stupid reason, but then to also kill your own mother? What the f Jill. I love that our ghost face killers are a bunch of greasy losers, but like Jill is the biggest one out of all of them. Being the definition of a femme cell, Jill Roberts literally just wants to kill all of her friends, all of her family that so that she can be famous and have fans instead. I mean, oh my God, what a jerk. <laughs> and you're telling me Charlie simped for her, man? She's nuts, dude. Jill is so crazy to the point where after she thought she was successful in killing everybody, she even self mutilates herself in one of the hardest to watch scenes in the entire franchise. When she stabs herself in the shoulder and then runs into that picture frame, I mean, it's just so fucked up to see somebody do this to themselves, by themselves in this house, too. Ugh, that scene in Scream 4 is just so hard to watch. It's so well done. Emma Roberts plays this character so well. I don't know. I love everything about Jill Roberts. Hashtag Jill Train, hashtag bring back Jill Roberts. I'm totally kidding. 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 I promise. Just a joke. Talking about trains and bringing people back, though, at number one, taking the gold medal is, of course, Stu Mocker. Matthew Lillard is the Phenomenal as Stu Mocker, which is easily the most memorable and over-the-top ghost face we have ever gotten. Like I was saying earlier, the campiness of this character only works because he's countered by Billy Loomis, who is much more sociopathic and just down-to-earth, kind of scary and live emotionless and all that. It, it works so well because he's sucking all the emotion out of the room, directing it all towards him. If Billy Loomis was the same as Stu, I would argue that original movie wouldn't work as well. That's why the camp in Scream 1 works for me. It's not too in your face, and when it ever becomes too much, you get a line from Billy Loomis opposed to Stu. Like, Stu only has a few lines here and there, but they all land, they all work, because they're not just constantly shoving it down your face. There is much more to the over-the-topness of Stu Mocker, though. He's also subtly misogynistic, adding another layer to this very deep onion. <laughs> It's little things that you would totally miss on a first watch, too. Like, he's literally barking orders at his girlfriend Tatum to go get him a beer and all that, and she's like, really? Like, what the hell? One of the first times we meet him, he also talks about how Ghostface couldn't be a woman. Shout out to my female Ghostface killers, even you, Mrs. Loomis. I still appreciate you, even though you're ridiculous with your bug eyes. Stu is a sinister, misguided teenager, but on top of that, the, you know, the frosting and the sprinkles and all that, is that he gives this amazing over-the-top delivery where he's spitting all over the place. It's insane. You have to have that sinister foundation though if you're going to take it to that next step of campiness. Otherwise, you're just eating a handful of frosting. And that is way too sweet. <laughs> Stu Mocker is the perfect example of how to make a killer scary and campy at the same time. It can be done. It's, I know you hear both those things. You're like, Jake, come on, that's ridiculous. No, it, it can happen. I promise. Stu is terrifying with his subtle misogyny and the little knife fight him and Billy have at the end of this film, which is just horrifying to watch. But then on top of that, his goofy performance really works because of the elevated situation. This is how you write a ghost face killer. But what do you think about our ghost face killers? Do you actually think there was 14 of them? Do you count Sam or Sydney as ghost face killers? Do you not count Greg and Jason? Leave me something about it in the comments below. Thank you all so much for watching this ranking video of all our ghost face killers. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more horror content in the future. Please consider supporting me on Patreon by clicking that link in the description below. Thank you again for watching, and as always, don't forget to kill it out there, y'all.